It's no secret that quantum field theory is hard. In fact, many models built within the framework of quantum field theory, such as the standard model, are unsolvable, meaning that as far as we know, it's not possible to find exact analytical results for predictions of the theory. So how do we get around this so that we can actually use the theory? Usually, the answer is that we have to make some sort of approximation in order to get a result which is close enough to the exact result, but allows us to actually do the calculations necessary to get a prediction. There are a few ways to do this, but the most common is known as perturbation theory. If you've taken a calculus course or have been watching my streams, the idea of perturbation theory should be familiar. It's very closely related to a Taylor series expansion. Perturbation theory works by taking some small value that appears in the field theory we are using, like a unitless coupling constant or a mass ratio, and expanding the result we want to find into an infinite sum of terms, each proportional to a higher and higher power of this value. But wait, how does an infinite sum help us any more than the unsolvable equations we get without perturbation theory? Well, since the value we are expanding in is assumed to be small, each successive power of this value is going to be smaller than the last. For example, if our number, call it g, is 1 tenth, then g squared is 1 over 100, g cubed is 1 1 thousandth, and so on. Now, remember that the whole point of this is to get a prediction that we can compare with experiments. Since experiments will never have infinite precision, at some point we can just truncate the series since any extra terms we calculate will be smaller than the experimental error, and so the experiments will not be able to actually test these terms. As a note on language, we'll often refer to the order we are looking at in perturbation theory. All this really means is where the term we care about shows up in the sum. So the first term will be first order or leading order, the second term will be second order or next to leading order, and so on. While perturbation theory has the potential to make it possible to actually approximate quantities in quantum field theory that would otherwise be impossible to calculate, it doesn't mean that doing the calculations is a cakewalk. In fact, it tends to be quite technically challenging, especially beyond first order in perturbation theory. However, originally it was far more difficult, involving complicated expansions of field operators in terms of creation and annihilation operators, which must be ordered and contracted and commuted correctly. And this is just to set the problem up, let alone solving it. Thankfully, several physicists, including Feynman in his never-ending search to make things as simple as possible, found a far more efficient way. See, all of these perturbative calculations can be constructed from just two sets of building blocks, propagators and interactions. These interactions are where multiple particles come together and, well, interact, while the propagators take each particle from interaction to interaction. Each of these building blocks can be represented graphically. The propagator is just a line, and the interaction is a vertex where multiple lines meet. What's more is that each of these building blocks has a mathematical rule associated with it, which can be simply read off from the equation describing the theory, called the Lagrangian or Lagrangian density. What was discovered was that every piece of the perturbation series directly corresponds to a diagram built from these lines and vertices. These diagrams became known as Feynman diagrams. In order to exactly reproduce the perturbation series, all one has to do is draw all possible Feynman diagrams that one can construct from the fundamental vertices and propagators, with some set of external legs corresponding to the incoming and outgoing states. Then just plug in the rules, called the Feynman rules, for each of these building blocks that are read off from the Lagrangian, do some integrals, and you have a result. Typically, we deal with theories where the parameters, which determine the strengths of interactions between particles, known as couplings, are small. So in many cases, especially with the standard model, we perturb with respect to these couplings. This means that the order of perturbation series a Feynman diagram is at is given by the number of vertices the diagram has. Here, it's important to note a few things about Feynman diagrams. 
When we write down a Feynman diagram, we aren't writing down a true-to-form kinematical description of what's going on. So we don't really care about the angles that we draw the propagator lines or external lines at or anything like that. So if two Feynman diagrams have the same intermediate states, but maybe shifted in time or space, then we'll still regard them as the same diagram. It's also important to know how momentum is flowing through the diagram, since momentum and energy has to be conserved at each vertex. This is one of the places where Feynman diagrams can be confusing. Some people prefer to have time running left to right, while some prefer to have time running from bottom to top. It's important to know which of these we're dealing with, since the same diagram can correspond to different processes altogether in these different conventions. So which of these will I be using? Well, neither. I personally find it much more clear to just explicitly label all of the momenta in the diagram. To me, this is the least ambiguous, so it's the notation I'll stick to. Let's take a look at how this works in quantum electrodynamics. In QED, we have three main building blocks, the propagator for the photon, which we will represent by a wavy line, the propagator for the charged fermion, represented by a solid straight line with an arrow on it, and a vertex where two fermions meet with the photon. The arrow on the fermion line is actually very important. We know that spinner fields can correspond to either an incoming fermion or an outgoing antifermion, while conjugate spinner fields can correspond to either an incoming antifermion or an outgoing fermion. The three-particle QED coupling mathematically consists of one spinner field, one conjugate spinner field, and one vector field corresponding to the photon. So we can say that the solid line with the arrow pointing into the vertex is the spinner, and the solid line with the arrow pointing out of the vertex is the conjugate spinner. The way we label the momentum will determine if this is a fermion or an antifermion. The fermion will always have the arrow on the line pointed in the same direction as the momentum, and the antifermion will always have the arrow on the line pointed in the opposite direction of the momentum. Now, let's look at an example in QED. Say we want to consider the case where we send in an electron and a positron, they interact, and we get an electron and positron out, a process known as Baba scattering. So, to construct our Feynman diagrams, we need to take four external lines with correctly oriented momenta, so that we have the correct initial and final states, and find all of the ways of connecting these external lines, which are allowed by the propagators and vertices which show up in our theory. At leading order, it's fairly straightforward to show that we only have two possibilities. Making sure that we conserve energy and momentum at each vertex, we can now just take these two diagrams and use our Feynman rules to convert them into mathematical expressions. But what do these expressions actually correspond to? What have we calculated? In fancy language, the sum of these terms gives the leading order approximation to the quantum mechanical transition amplitude from the initial to the final state. Other common names that these transition amplitudes go by are the scattering matrix elements, S matrix elements, or just matrix elements for short. Unfortunately, there isn't a whole lot of physical intuition for what these amplitudes are actually telling us. But the important thing is that they're used in calculations which tell us the likelihood of a given event occurring, called the cross-section. Or, in the case where we have one particle going to multiple, this is called a decay width. In the example we just considered, if we plug in our amplitude that we got from the sum of our Feynman diagrams into the equation for the cross-section, we'll find a prediction for how likely it is for an electron and a positron to scatter in this way. Now, we should make a few notes about Feynman diagrams and perturbation theory in general. First off, when we have particles on the inside of a Feynman diagram, it turns out that they're allowed to behave in strange ways. Oftentimes, in order to conserve energy and momentum at each vertex, these internal particles must be off-shell, just meaning that they do not satisfy the energy relations of special relativity. This may seem scary, and like we're breaking the rules of special relativity, but worry not. Since these particles are always internal, they will never be real detectable particles. 
So even if they show up inside Feynman diagrams, we'll never observe any off-shell particles and special relativity is safe. These types of particles, which only show up internally, are often called virtual particles for exactly this reason. Although I've made it seem as though Feynman diagrams are a wonderful savior of particle physics, they're not without their problems. In particular, as we allow for more and more vertices, the number of Feynman diagrams that we can have grows very fast. In our example of qed baba scattering, if we neglect any diagrams with loops on external lines that can be absorbed into the definitions of the fermions, at second order, we have 10 diagrams, and at third order, we have 122. And this is only for the very simple case of QED with only electrons and positrons. If we look at the full standard model, we already have over a thousand Feynman diagrams for this process at only second order. So we can see that Feynman diagrams can very quickly become quite computationally expensive. Finally, we should address a very important question. Is this what's actually happening in nature? Can we say that particles interact by tossing virtual particles back and forth, which themselves split and recombine in many different complicated ways? Well, we probably shouldn't. Here's why. Remember that perturbation theory, and therefore the use of Feynman diagrams, is really just an approximation tool. So unless we calculate all the infinite number of Feynman diagrams, we're never going to be able to exactly describe what's happening in nature. Even more so, since we have to add all of these Feynman diagrams up to get a total amplitude, to say any one process is happening over any other is a big quantum mechanical no-no. Finally, we also know that perturbation theory is not the full picture, since the theories where it even makes sense to use perturbation theory form a tiny, tiny subset of all possible quantum field theories. Even within this subset of theories, there are many well-known non-perturbative effects, phenomena that are impossible to see in perturbation theory, even if we calculate all the infinite number of Feynman diagrams. So really, we should say that in between the ingoing and outgoing states, we can't know what's actually happening. However, in special cases, we can get a good approximation to the true physics by modeling it as real external particles exchanging virtual internal particles, which we can calculate through the use of Feynman diagrams. Luckily for us, perturbation theory is perfectly valid for much of the standard model, so it's become commonplace to use Feynman diagrams as a quick and easy way to describe certain processes. However, as we will discuss in later videos, even in certain sectors of the standard model, we run into unavoidable breakdowns in perturbation theory from quantum effects, forcing us to come up with novel ways of approaching these calculations. For now though, we can be happy that for many cases in the standard model, perturbation theory and Feynman diagrams are a wonderful way to make our lives easier.